My name is Mike Aben, and welcome to my KSP campaign. In just four days, we're going to be launching Duna 1, which is going to be my first interplanetary craft, an unmanned craft, but still a big event. But before we get to that, we do have a couple of pieces of business to take care of, one of which being I need to pick myself up another uh, Kerbinaut, specifically an engineer, and specifically... Hate to say this, ladies, but a male engineer. Yeah, you know, since the death of Ribfell some episodes ago, my only males of my Kerbinot core are Bill, Jeb, and Bob. And, uh, you know, they were starting to feel a little bit in, you know, maybe it's good for them to feel a little bit in a minority, but I think it's time to a uh, little bit of affirmative action, I think, was in order. So, picked up my newest engineer here. What is his name? Bartner. There he is. Bartner the engineer. That gives me three engineers, three scientists, and five pilots for a total of 11 active Kerbinauts. I think that's pretty good. I think that's going to do me for quite some time. And that brings us to another launch of the Curse Dock 5. And I am completely losing track of how many of these things I've put into space. And if you're getting a little bit tired of seeing Curse Dock 5s, well, too bad because I got two more in the building queue. You won't be seeing them this episode, but probably in the next episode. Though this is an improved Curse Stock 5. Uh, it's got a number of things that I've added on to it that I've recently unlocked. Uh, the first of which you're going to see here are Separatrons. There they go. Nice. I've embedded them into the nose cones there to help push the booster stages away. It's nice having those now. I did start playing with designing a Curse Stock 6, an improved version of this. The problem is, is I don't have a three-person capsule yet. And uh, so I ended up building this thing that I thought looked really cool. Um, but it only still carried two Kerbals. And it was expensive as hell. And it was going to take forever to build. And so I thought to myself, well, why on earth am I doing this? So, uh, I, you know, these things here, they're pretty cheap. I can pump them out uh, really quickly. So until I get the three-person capsules unlocked, I think this is still going to be my little orbital taxi. The other new part that this thing has is a docking port. Um, so, and it's right there at the top, which unfortunately means that the escape tower can no longer be used as a backup engine because I need to get rid of it in order to use the docking port. So I'm just going to turn this off to the side. So that when we decouple, it'll kind of spin off to the side. I don't have to worry about running into it again. Now, we are suborbital right now, so that thing is just going to burn up in the atmosphere. Um, now, without having that backup engine, I ended up putting on these sort of radial Rockomax engines on the side. So those are going to act as a backup engine in case the main engine fails. I don't want anybody stuck in orbit. And it was after kind of... It's, I launched this thing that I started to realize, you know, that's, that's really quite dumb because although this thing has a dark docking port, what it's lacking is RCS. And what would have been way smarter for me to do was to put some monoprop on this thing. And in fact, just filling up the capsule with monoprop would have been enough monoprop for what it needed. Put on some RCS thrusters, just like three of them would have been enough of those thruster blocks. That could have, the RCS could have been a backup engine to deorbit. It also would have been maneuvering thrusters. So, uh, well, next time. <laughs> what else is new on this thing? I also have uh, the little tail fins instead of the big uh, flappy tail fins. I think they look a little better. And the reason why I can get away with the little tail fins now is because I, although I've had it unlocked forever, um, I, I put on some big reaction wheels, the 1.25 meter reaction wheels, onto the ascent stage so that uh, that can provide the attitude control and then I don't need the big flappy tail fins. You have likely noticed by now that there is no crew aboard the Kerr stock, and that is because it's on its way to the Kerbin station to act as a lifeboat for Jebediah and Glafia. Jebediah and Glafia have been piling the Korion around for the last 20 game days, and uh, the original craft that they took up uh, was used by Tamley and Chrissy, I believe, the first two Kerbals that they rescued. They, they took it back down to the surface, and since then, Jebediah and Glafia have been left with no way to get back down to the surface, the, uh, no lifeboat. So uh, I think having a lifeboat for them is an important thing. So I'm going to get that, uh, get that up to the station where it will be there in case it is needed. 
Now, although the curse dock has a docking port, there is not a free docking port on the station. Uh, the only docking, you know, the two docking ports are being used to connect the Karayan and the station together. I thought about maybe bringing up some sort of a docking hub, but the only docking ports I have are the small ones, the juniors, the 0.625 meter ones. And I don't want to bring those up, only to have to switch them out later. Um, so, you know, I thought, you know, now I'll wait till I have some decent docking ports before I bring up a hub, and I'm just going to use uh, some KAS to hook this together, and I'm trying to aim sort of towards the right of the station. Yeah, the rendezvous uh, data is not helping me anymore. I'm going to just have to eyeball it. I uh, don't have a docking alignment indicator or anything like that. So I'm aiming to go to the right of the station and be connected to the station part, not to the Korion. So I'm just going to thrust. And I'm really looking at the nap ball, right? I'm looking at that retrograde icon and the target icon, which is, I believe, to the center of mass. Well, it would be right to where that uh, waypoint is, I would assume. So to me, I'm going to the right and a bit down or south right now. Seems to be working all right. Okay. Yeah, this seems to be drifting in here fine. Let's bring our relative velocity down to zero. Okay, it says zero on the nap ball, but I can tell I'm still drifting backwards. So just a little tiny puff. That looks stoppished to me. <laughs> so it's time to get Glafia out here. We'll turn this thing so it's oriented the same way as the station, and then we'll get Glafia out there to uh, join it up with some KAS pipe endpoints. Now the curse stock here uh, brought up an extra pair of endpoints. So now I have four of these endpoints, which is good. I can make two uh, pipes out of that. Um, never, you know, doesn't hurt to have more of these pipes together. So Glafia is going to expertly connect the two together. She has definitely become our resident expert at this. You can see here that uh, once the curse dock wasn't the active vehicle anymore, it began to rotate. So I ended up with this, it looks kind of annoying. But then that gave me an idea about how I might be actually able to put the curse dock's docking port to some use. If I pointed the curse dock radially outwards, it might actually become a useful second docking port for this space station. So the first step in all of this would be to get Jeb in there. So I'm going to transfer Jeb over to the curse dock. And at the same time answering the age-old questions, do Kerbals fit through pipes? The answer, of course, being, of course they do. And then Glafi is going to go out there and disconnect the curse dock allowing Jeb to be able to rotate it and point that docking port radially outwards. Oops, had the SAS off there. All right, Jeb, let's see, which way we gotta bring this up and then which way do we gotta go here? Nope, not that way, this way, there we go. All right, so that looks pretty radial and then I'm gonna rotate it so that the docking port looks horizontal ish Again, I'm just going by the line on that docking port. You can see in the middle of the docking port, that looks pretty good. And then it's back to the Gofia. Connect this thing back up again. You might be noticing while she's doing this, by the way, that she has uh, a little communitron in her inventory. Uh, yeah, we noticed. I noticed that there was an extra communitron on the curse dock. I must have had two-way symmetry going when I put the first communitron on. So. Well, waste not, wand not, and uh, Glafia being a bit of a hoarder, she figured you never know when you might need this, so she decided to hang on to it. All right, so let's back up and take a look at this thing. Hmm. You know, I'll be the first to admit, this is far from the most attractive space station I've ever built or seen, but it's functional. It should work. I think it's going to work fine for me. And before we leave Jeb and Glafia for this episode, I have one more quick thing to show you. This is the Action Group Manager mod. And what it does is very simple. It allows you to edit your action groups while in flight, uh, rather than just in this place, space plane hangar or in the vehicle assembly building. Um, a really useful mod. I really like it. And uh, the reason why. I'm using it right here is because remember a few episodes 
uh, Glafia got into this installing lights and fixing lights on the Kurion, well, unfortunately, those lights are not part of the light action group. So here, for instance, I turned off the lights and you can see that some of them are still on. But what I can do is use this action group manager to assign those lights as well to the light action group so that now when I turn the lights on and off, they actually all do come on and off. And I got a feeling as I do more and more construction in space, this particular mod is going to become uh, useful once again. Yes, a nice little mod. Uh, I know there's also uh, Action Groups Extended. That's another mod, but it does a lot more with Action Groups than this. I wanted something, just, just that's all it did, just exactly what you saw. A nice light little mod just for that. But anyway, it's time for us to go and check in on how JunkSat3 is doing in its orientation around the moon. You may recall that last episode, JunkSat 3 entered into an orbit around the moon, and the goal is for it to end up being 120 degrees from JunkSat 2 here. Um, right now, if you take a look at the phase angle, the phase angle is 264 degrees. It's measuring it in a, from this perspective, a counterclockwise direction. That's why the phase angle is more than that, but if you take 360 and subtract um, 120, it should be 240 degrees. So it's still got some more uh, more angles to drop. Now it's in an orbit that is five minutes less than the two-day orbit that JunkSat 2 is in. So it is slowly uh, getting further and further away from it. But a better place in which to do the comparison is at periapsis. So what we'll do is we'll time warp towards periapsis and take a look at what the phase angle is there. And right there, the phase angle is 255 degrees. Remember what I'm shooting for is 240 degrees. Now it should be gaining about five degrees per orbit. But I do want to keep a careful eye on it because I don't want it to end up going by and then I got to go all the way around again or I have to start to s slow it down. And, you know, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to check on it after each of its orbits. So that's a simple thing for me to do. All I have to do is set an alarm for periapsis, which is going to be about another two days away. When it gets back to periapsis, that will be another orbit. So uh, and then we'll see on how it's doing. And with that done, it's time for us to get on to the main event. This is Duna 1, and the mission, well, fairly obviously, is going to Duna. Now, this is obviously an unmanned probe. It is an orbiter. It's going to orbit in and around Duna. Uh, it'll go and investigate Ike, and uh, we'll talk a little bit later about the whole Delta V requirements and how I, uh, how I designed this mission and what the plan is. Uh, just also to make sure that you know, all you're going to see me do this episode is to plot my transfer burn out to Duna. And we will take the opportunity to talk about plotting interplanetary transfer burns and all that kind of stuff. Because this is the first time I'm doing it in this particular series. Um, but it's going to be a while until I get to Duna. So do not expect me to be getting to Duna in this episode or in any episode in the near future. And we'll talk about that fairly soon. Um, the lifter, the lifter as you can see is, um, you know, it's pretty close to the lifter I've been using on all the curse stocks. It's, it, that's become a pretty standard list, lifter. The only thing I've got added to it are these uh, big SR, I got a couple of notifications here. Uh, vessel, oh, another curse stock 5 is complete and a contract is complete. Okay, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'll deal with that later because I am coming close to booster separation and then we'll deal with those two notifications that are coming up. Yeah, this has become a pretty good lifter for me. I just put these big SRBs on it just to get it off of the pad. Here comes our SRB separation. I love those separatrons. So nice pushing those things away. And we'll recover those later. Get back some of that costs. Okay, so a curse stock 5 got complete. Um, let's uh, start that vessel rolling out. So rolling out, that's going to take an hour and 42 minutes. Unfortunately, launch pad's going to take more than a day to recondition. So it's going to be a little over a day before I can launch that guy. And that won't be this episode, but you will be seeing that next episode. 
looking at the contract that was complete. What contract got completed? Come on. Here we go. Oh, yeah, the network around the moon. That network around the moon is now complete. It's done its shakeout. That was counting down. I remember last episode. It was uh, 474, almost 474,000 curb bucks. That's not bad. Considering especially that every single one of those satellites uh, are repurposed satellites that were used to help complete other contracts. Uh, so that was a pretty, pretty uh, profitable set of missions. I guess the cost, the only thing I did end up spending was getting the Korine out there. And so that was the cost of fuel, which isn't as cheap as you think because we're hauling the fuel out from... Um, Kerbin surface, which is always expensive. It's going to be so sweet when we get the resource mining going and we can start uh, refining that fuel in space. Okay, let's start talking Delta V. And if you get yourself a Delta V map, which is pretty easy to find on the internet anywhere, there's a number of them made for a Kerbal Space Program, you will find out that to escape the Kerbin sphere of influence costs about 950 meters per second. The transfer out to Duna is another 380 meters per second. And then once in Duna's sphere of influence, to do a low orbit capture around Duna is 380 meters per second. That gets us to a total of 1,690 meters per second of delta V just to get myself into a low uh, orbit around Duna. This particular vessel, once we lose the lifter, is composed of actually two stages. There is a trans... Whoa, what is this? Oh, science alert. Oh, yes, the good old barometer. The atmospheric pressure scan. I discovered this during testing that you can do pressure scans in space. The instrument reads zero. It's as if it were in a vacuum. And for some reason, that's 10.8 science. Well, I can transmit 5.4 that science. That makes no sense. I had no idea you could do that. I've had the barometer unlocked forever. Oh, that's, that's silly. That doesn't make any sense at all. Anyway, enough of that. Go away. Let's get back to um, Delta V. That's what we're talking about. Okay, this particular vessel is, com is composed of actually two stages once we lose the ascent stage. There's a transfer stage on the bottom and then the actual main probe above it. The transfer stage um, is 1,083 meters per second of delta V in it. And the probe, actually it's more than that, but I'll get to that in a second. And the probe has 1,592 meters per second of delta V for a total of 2,675 meters per second, almost 1,000 more than what I need. And that's because my goal here is not just to simply put it into low Duna orbit. I want to explore Ike, I want to do mapping, I'm going to go to polar orbits. The whole shebang. So I got quite a bit extra. Transfer out to Duna, or uh, from low Duna orbit out to Ike is 330 meters per second. To get a capture around Ike in low orbit is about 180 meters per second. But I'm not going to go into low orbit around Duna, then go out to Ike. That's a really inefficient way to do it. Um, I'll be kind of playing it by ear when I get out there. That's really what's going to be happening, right? Because there's lots of opportunities for fuel savings. You could, if Ike is positioned correctly, get a gravity assist to help slow you down as you come into Duna's sphere of influence, and that will save you some fuel. There's also the arrow braking option. I'll probably be taking advantage of that. Um, There'll be lots of different things that we'll do, but it's all kind of stuff I gotta play by ear depending upon where Ike is in relation to Duna and us as we enter into the Duna sphere of influence. Okay, now that we are in low Kerbin orbit, let's take a closer look at the vessel. So the main probe itself, the probe itself is up on the top and its most distinctive feature is obviously the buttload of solar panels that you see uh yeah and they are not superfluous you got to remember that as you get further away from the sun the inverse square law is in play in kerbal space program and those solar panels will become less efficient in fact at duna they're only about uh, about 50 percent as efficient as what they are uh, near Kerbin. So you got to pretty much double the number of solar panels you would normally need. 
On the bottom is a transfer stage, and its most distinctive feature are the, well, monoprop cans that you can see right here. And I have these monoprop thrusters on there as well. And the purpose of the monoprop is so that when I'm out of liquid fuel and oxidizer, I can use the monoprop to deorbit that particular stage so I don't have this chunk of debris kind of floating around. And in fact, even if I'm on an escape trajectory, uh, leaving Kerbin's sphere of influence, there's enough monoprop on this thing to actually affect its trajectory and get it to crash back into Kerbin. A transfer stage like this is especially useful if your probe is using a low thrust engine like an ion drive, because uh, getting out of low orbit around Kerbin on low thrust, although completely doable, is a little trickier. But anyway, let's talk about the transfer to Duna. So there's Duna in our yellow orbit up ahead of us. It's ahead of us because we are going faster because we are in a lower orbit. It actually works remarkably the same thing as any, uh, in any way as, as a regular rendezvous. You want, uh, you know, we're in the lower orbit. Kerbin's in a lower orbit than Duna, so we want to be behind it because we are moving faster and that allows us to catch up. We do have to burn in a prograde direction direction relative to Kerbin's orbit. So what you're going to be doing is you're going to be putting your maneuver node on the leading, or sorry, the trailing edge of Kerbin as it goes around the atmosphere, um, and then burning outwards to get your escape trajectory. Now we'll zoom out and take a look at it from out here. And you can see from this perspective, it's just like doing really any other kind of rendezvous. Now, you got to time the burn right. And one of the things that really helps is to get the periapsis of your burn right where Kerbin is. That tells you that you actually have your, your uh, burn in the right location in Kerbin's orbit. Uh, you, if you get on the internet, you can find devices that will give you things like ejection angles and all that kind of stuff. You actually don't have to worry about that. You know, it's much, much easier just to use the maneuver node now. What I'm going to be doing, because I am in orbit quite a bit earlier of my launch window, so I'm going to be using the plus orbit button on precise node to dial forward in time. And in fact, I had to dial quite a ways forward in time. Here I am over 26 days into the future, and it, but it doesn't take a lot of playing around. Uh, with the timing of the burn, and again, what you want to do, you can see my periapsis now is getting ahead of where I am in Kerbin's orbit, because that's how far it's going to be in the future when I go to do the burn. And I want the encounter to occur at the opposite, at apoapsis. That's the most efficient way to do it. And boom, there we go. It's pretty close. A little bit more playing around. I'm pretty happy with that. That looks good. That's a 1,044 meter per second burn, which is actually 286 meters per second less than what the Delta V map's telling me it should be. So I can't complain about that. But now what we'll do is we'll select Duna and we'll see what our encounter is like. Because we're going to be, obviously, at some point in tweak, tweaking this. Now, Duna, to be quite frank, is one of the easier encounters to get. Because uh, Duna is not inclined towards Kerbin at all. And uh, so that means you can get these encounters with just a single burn. But usually you end up having to tweak the burn a little bit. So here I'm sort of just tweaking the amount of prograde just a bit, but I can see that I'm going to have to bring my encounter northward. So the way we're going to do that is with a correction burn, and just like when we were going to the moon or when we were going to Minmus, that correction burn is best done out here in the middle of nowhere. And that correction burn turned out to be very minor, only around 9 meters per second, and I was did a little bit, of course, more playing around with both burns. Uh, again, precise node allowing you to easily bounce back and forth between the two nodes. And I ended up with this pretty much direct hit on Duna. Now, I I'm just going to stop at that right there because uh, I'm not planning on hitting Duna. That's not what my game plan is going to be. But I know as well that that escape burn is... I'm not going to execute that one perfectly. So I'll be tweaking this second burn again anyway. So for now that's good enough. We'll have to come back to this in 26 days. If you think that's a long time, it's going to be 314 days until our encounter with Duna. So clearly you're not going to be seeing any of that in this particular episode because I think this episode is going to be drawing to a close. I thank you for watching and I hope to see you next time.